All right, welcome to our first recording in hematology. So we will be going over the week two lecture information in this recording. I'm not going to lecture through week one. You guys have already kind of looked at it. Um, you should be studying for your first quiz, which will include weeks chapters one through four from week one. I feel those four chapters are pretty introductory, and I think that you guys would do really well on those um, on that quiz, just looking at the announcement, the quiz pointers, and just looking through those PowerPoints and the chapters in your textbook. So we're going to focus on week two, and then we'll do a lecture every week. So just an FYI, all of this can be found in the calendar for when the weekly review sessions are, these lecture sessions. And I also do exam review. So the week prior, the weekend prior to an exam week, we will have an exam review session as well. Again, all that is in the calendar for the course. So just to kind of help guide you on when I plan a meeting. And of course, everything is recorded because I do know that everybody has different time schedules. So everything will be recorded. As soon as we're done, I will post the recording link in the announcements. And then I also have created, um, and I just did this, but I also created a page on the left side. So like on the left side of your course where it says module one, module two, there's going to be a page that's called lecture slash exam review session recordings. It's going to be right above where the syllabus link is. And then I will add all the recordings to that page as we go. So that way, in five weeks, if you want to go back and find a different recording from a while ago, you can just go to that page and all the recordings to that point will be in one spot for you. So it just makes it a little bit easier. All right, let's see. Um, anything else I want to share before we get started? Pretty much, I think that is it. One note, and I did mention this if you're in my other class, I teach microbiology as well. I do lecture fast. Um, I talk really fast. I've been told that a lot. I don't realize that I talk that fast, but people do say I do. So the beautiful thing about a recording is you can pause it, take notes, restart it, pause it, that kind of thing. I will do my best to try to slow down a bit, but I just kind of get in my rhythm and I go. Um, but just know I am aware of it, you know, but that's the great thing about listening to your recording is you can pause me anytime that you need to. So other than that, I think that's about it. I feel like there was one other thing that I was going to mention, but now I can't remember it. So, um, yeah, so I will just jump start into the three PowerPoints for this week. So again, we're going to start with the week two information, and there are three PowerPoints. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so that we can show them. All right. So we are going to start with chapter, I believe it's chapter six. I know if you guys have a new book, new textbook, and some of the chapter numbers in the textbook changed by one number, try to go by the title or the subject, and it'll be the same thing. Whether you're using the old edition or the new edition, it's the same content. It's just they adjusted some of the numbers. So if I ever say a chapter number and it's not exactly right, I'm probably it's probably just one chapter different number. The content is what is important. So in this case, we are looking at the chapter that's all about the function and morphology of cellular components. Hopefully this is kind of a review for you from anatomy and physiology or a biology class, but it is still important to remember our basic elements to a cell. So cells overall are organized into three parts, by the way, I don't read the objective slide to you guys ever. That's always there if you kind of want to know what you're supposed to get from each chapter, but I'm not going to read it out to you. Um, you guys know how to read. All right, so cells are organized in three parts. We have unit membranes, cytoplasm, and nucleus. So in each of these parts are different things. So we'll start with the cell membrane. That is the outer edge of the cell. It has functions in that it helps interchange substances from the inside of the cell to the outside. It detects hormone signals from cell to cell recognition. And then located on the surface of that cell membrane are markers, surface markers. We will get into these, especially in hematology too. Those get to be more important for us. All right, the cell membrane is made up of different proteins. Mostly they're glycoproteins in nature. There's two main types, integral and peripheral. I do ask that you remember both types, what they are. Um, integral can penetrate to the outside of the membrane or just stay on the inside, but it serves as the transport system between the two environments. 
peripheral is only on the inner side, the um, cytoplasmic side, and will help with the cytoskeleton structure. All right, moving to the nucleus, that is always what we call the brain of our cell. It consists of DNA inside that nucleus, so that is where we have replication transcription. Part of that nucleus is going to be made up of chromatin, and then we have the nuclear envelope, and then it has nucleoli. So here is what the difference with chromatin can look. And when we start to learn how to identify our different white blood cells, I talk a lot about chromatin on a couple of the cells. I always reference, oh, the chromatin is really loose or stringy in this, but yet it's really condensed in this one. It actually plays a big role in identifying cells. So chromatin is essentially the nucleic acids and proteins inside that nucleus. It kind of makes it look patchy or really dark. So if you look at these two cells, there are two different cells here, and you look at the nucleus, which is the large object in the center, Inside that nucleus is made up of this chromatin. You'll see the cell on the left, you can see the white patches, correct? And then you see kind of some darker areas. That's what we would call lacy or stringy or patchy chromatin because you can see the white areas. It's not completely condensed. Whereas the cell on the right is condensed chromatin. It's all very much more block dark pattern. There isn't as much lightness to it, not as much white patches and you know, that kind of thing. So that makes a big difference is that chromatin pattern. So you will hear me reference that as we start to learn how to identify our cells. Other parts of the nucleus is the nuclear envelope that just surrounds that nucleus. It's like the nuclear membrane, if you will. And then inside some of the cells nucleus are nucleoli. Typically nucleoli are found in very young, immature cells. And then as the cells get older, they will lose that nucleoli. So not the mature cells won't have them. But nucleoli is where you will find the site of synthesis for your cell's ribosomes. So that's really important. So the number of ribosomes that you have will equal how much protein synthesis is occurring. So the number is directly proportional. So if you have a lot of nucleoli, you're making a lot of protein as a result. So keep that in mind. That is important to know. All right, so when we look at the cells here, they're and now I know it's not easy. You guys don't need to know what these cells are, but I want to show you how to identify nucleoli because, again, this is going to become important when you start to learn how to identify cells. So when I look at the cells on the left, these are very, you see the big purple nucleus. Inside that nucleus are going to be little round light areas. So I'm hoping, I'm praying that you guys can see my arrow on the screen. But if you look at this middle cell on the left, there's this little round area that is light in color, and that is the nucleoli. So there'd be one in this cell, and one nucleoli. If you go to the cell above that, there are two nucleoli within that nucleus. There's one here and one up there. If you guys cannot see my arrow, please ask your instructor to point them out to you, your lab instructor, just because I don't know how else to do it if you're not able to see my arrow. And then if you go to the slide on the right, it had the arrow pointing at it, but obviously that doesn't turn out very well. It's there. It's just harder to see. I feel like the cells on the left are easier to see. So that's nucleoli. Here, there's some really great examples. If you go to letter B, there is definitely some nucleoli here. So there, again, the round, lighter colored areas within that nucleolus. There's a couple right there. Letter C has several. There's one there, one there one there. Letter D has a really nice big one right there. So again, those are how you identify nucleoli, the round, lighter areas within the nucleus. All right, so now we'll go on to the cytoplasm of the cell. The cytoplasm is going to contain all your organelles. So I'm sure this is bringing back biology memories. Um, so your Golgi complex, the endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes, mitochondria, and so on. So we're going to go through each one of these. Now, every cell that we're going to start to learn how to identify in hematology will have different amounts of cytoplasm. And we do use that. We use how much cytoplasm is present and the color of it to help us identify cells. So when you look at this, cytoplasm is anything around that nucleus. So in this case, this cell right here doesn't have a ton of cytoplasm. It's not that much. The nucleus kind of takes up almost the entire cell. 
All right, so let's go through kind of the main function of each organelle that I need you to remember. So the Golgi complex is the area where you modify, sort, and package molecules. It is typically located right next to the nucleus. And in fact, on certain cells, when you go to stain them, the Golgi doesn't really stain well. And so it'll be this white area next to the nucleus that never picked up stain. And you can see that in the cell I'm showing you here in the picture. You can see the cytoplasm here is a really dark blue, except, oh, that little white area right next to the nucleus, that's the Golgi. It just doesn't take that stain very well. So I would remember that. All right, the endoplasmic reticulum, of course, you can have either rough ER or smooth ER, just depends on if it has or doesn't have ribosomes. But again, it's all about storing proteins. Ribosomes will help make the proteins, and then the ER can help store them, is essentially what it does. And so here's ribosomes. So ribosomes are made of RNA. So again, they will help with protein synthesis, and you can find ribosomes freely in the cytoplasm. You can find them attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And of course, you can find them in the nucleoli. So we already had seen that um, back on the nucleoli slide. So again, the more ribosomes present, the more protein synthesis that occurs. As a result of that, the more basophilic looking the cell is. What that means is cells will look really basophilic in color, meaning really dark blue. So if some cell has a ton of protein synthesis occurring, those ribosomes stain very dark blue. So that whole cell cytoplasm will look really, really dark. Kind of like um, the cell that you, right here, this cell that I just showed you on the Golgi slide, very dark, dark blue cytoplasm. That tells me it's probably got quite a bit of protein synthesis still happening. It's very basophilic in color is what we would call that. Okay, so if you look here then and I ask you, well, which one is basophilic, it should be obvious the one that's really dark blue is the one on the left. The one on the right is more pinky colored cytoplasm. Yes, exactly, the one on the left, good. So hopefully anytime you hear the word basophilic to describe a cell, which you will hear it, it just means a really dark blue cytoplasm. All right, mitochondria, hopefully energy comes to mind right away whenever you think of mitochondria. It's the place where we make energy for our cells. So that's all you need to remember there. Lysozyme, lysozymes, lysosomes will contain enzymes that help with the phagocytosis process. So when those cells that do phagocytize and engulf bacteria that shouldn't be there, they help destroy it. So they're a really big part of that phagocytosis immune system process. When you stain a cell, they will look like granules a lot of times. They'll look like granules in the cytoplasm. Microfilaments consist of different proteins that will help with cytoskeleton, motility, cell division. And microtubules will help with the cell shape. And that is it for our first chapter. So I'm praying that some of that was review. I know it might have been a while for you guys if you talk cell stuff, but I would know just basic function of each one of those and then anything extra that I might have pointed out. All right, so now we are going to go to our next PowerPoint, which is on hematopoietic theory. This to me is always the very start to hematology. I always view this chapter as the start. Hematopoiesis is really the backbone of learning hematology. So this is probably to me our first really big chapter that we're getting into. So without further ado, let me jump into it here. So I'm going to skip through the objectives. You guys know how to read those. So the word itself, hematopoiesis, is basically meaning blood cell development. So it's the development of all of our blood cells. So that's going to be the red cells, the white cells, the platelets. So all those blood cells being developed. Now, there are three phases of fetal hematopoiesis. So in a fetus, um, here's the phases that it goes through to start with the blood cell development in a fetus. And now if you've been in immunology, you've probably already learned this. If you haven't been in immunology, that's okay. We're going to learn it here, and you definitely need to keep knowing this. So it will start with what we call the yolk sac phase, then it will move to the hepatic liver phase, and then it will finally go to the medullary, which is your bone marrow phase. So Around the 19th day, it will start making blood cells in the yolk sac phase. 
So we'll have very, very primitive, very, very young, young, young erythro blasts. Basically, really young red cells being made with just a little bit of hemoglobin in there around the 19th day, about the second week, if you will. Around four to five weeks, we'll start making cells in our liver, the hepatic phase. And this is where we start to see more cells being picked up and producing. Um, you don't need to remember all the cells getting produced here, but at the last bullet, it does say developing erythroblasts, which are young, young red cells, signal the beginning of definitive hematopoiesis. So we really have hematopoiesis coming up and starting and thriving here. So you can see we have lots of cells, and that liver is going to maintain being a major site of development um, until the bone marrow takes over, but it will stay active until even after birth, shortly after birth. So the bone marrow will eventually take over the liver phase, but that liver can maintain activity until after birth. And it has other help from other organ systems in there. So, all right, and then finally the bone marrow, what we call the medullary phase. Um, this will begin around the fifth month, but it truly takes and becomes the primary site at the sixth month. So the bone marrow will completely become the number one site at the sixth month and will be for the rest of your life where your majority of your cells are made is in the bone marrow. Now, if your bone marrow should ever fail, which happens, your liver and other organs can start developing cells again if they need to. So, but again, most of us have our cells being made by the bone marrow. So again, you should know the yolk sac starts around the second week. The liver, what we call the hepatic phase, starts around four to five weeks. And then the bone marrow, the medullary, um, become, takes over at the six months. All right, so for adult hematopoiesis, um, basically adult blood cell development, bone marrow, lymph nodes, spleen, liver, and thymus, all will help with this proliferation and maturing of cells. So all will help with the development overall with it. But again, the bone marrow is the spot. So that is where you're making your red cells, what we call erythroid, your myeloid cells, which are gonna be some of the white blood cells, your megakaryocytic line, which is gonna be your platelets, and your lymphoid cells, which are some other types of white cells. We're gonna get into all of that. But we also have lymphoid tissue that is um, happening here. We have some that we've divided into primary and some that are secondary. So that primary lymphoid tissue is your bone marrow and your thymus. So the lymphocytes, there is a special type of white blood cell called lymphocyte. These have two different types of lymphocytes. We have what we call B lymphocytes that get made and differentiated in the bone marrow. And then we have T lymphocytes that um, become T lymphocytes in the thymus, T for thymus. So they're really big with those lymphocytes. There is, of course, secondary lymphoid tissue that also contributes and plays a role to development of the lymphocytes. But again, the primary tissues is the bone marrow and thymus. So for the most part, your bone marrow will have the red marrow, which is where you are actively making your cells, so the hematopoietically active marrow, and you can see it on the little skeleton diagram. So this red marrow would be the sternum, skull, vertebrae, ribs, pelvic bones, and ends of your long bones, like the ends of your femur. Yellow marrow is anything that's just composed of fat cells. So a little bit more on the liver. There are special cells in the liver called Kupfer cells. These are macrophages that help with removing debris, foreign items from the blood, and just kind of cleaning it up and getting rid of it. Again, the liver still plays an important role, so if your bone marrow should ever fail, your liver is capable of hematopoietic production if need be. Spleen is the largest of our lymphoid organs. It's constantly circulating and filtering blood through it. At any point in time, your spleen is containing roughly 350 mils that are going through there and getting filtered. So we have different macrophages in your spleen that are, again, looking for foreign items, cleaning it up, um, getting rid of anything that shouldn't be there, if you will. So in your spleen, there's three types of splenic tissue. I am not going to test you on the three types of splenic tissue. It's just there right there for information. So like I said, there is macrophages that are help making sure nothing that should be there is there. So a lot of times those macrophages will remove damaged red cells, old red cells, get rid of anything that's too old. 
sometimes it'll do what we call pitting, where if there's an inclusion in the red cell that should be there, it'll just bite that inclusion out. So that's what we call pitting. The other thing that's unique about the spleen that I want you to remember is that it is a storage site for platelets. At any point, there's about 30% of your platelet count stored in your spleen. Now, that does affect your platelet number if your spleen should get removed or if it is doing too much. So you have to think about that. If your if somebody gets a splenectomy where they remove their spleen, now that 30% of the platelet count is floating freely and your platelet number increases. So you have an increased platelet count because all of a sudden you have more platelets floating around than you were supposed to have. If you have the opposite, say you have a spleen and it's overactive, it's like splenomegaly, it's really enlarged and doing too much, then it will store more platelets than it's supposed to which means that you have a decreased platelet count in your bloodstream because too much of it's going and storing in the spleen. So always keep that in your mind, how that storage part to the spleen can affect your platelet count numbers. All right, the lymph nodes, again, part of the lymphatic system, they're huge with lymphocyte cells. I mean, the names themselves go together, lymphocytes and lymph nodes. That's the primary cell that's found throughout the lymphatic system. So they will help form new lymphocytes. Um, lymphocytes are the ones that make antibodies. They have a lot to do with filtering, again, of debris and that kind of stuff. So they play a role in that way. And finally, that thymus, like I mentioned, is specifically for T lymphocytes. If you skip, by the way, you'll notice I don't read my slides. Sorry if I jump around on you. But if you skip down toward the bottom, it says, um, it will receive lymphoid cells that migrate from the bone marrow. So these really young lymphoid cells are going to come from the bone marrow to the thymus. And when they're in the thymus, they're going to become and mature into T cells, T for thymus. So they are going to specifically come a T lymphocyte, and then they play a big role in our immune system. So when you get into immunology, you'll learn more about what the T cell role is there. All right, so now let's go to the stem cell theory, which is going to start the whole learning of hematopoiesis, essentially. So we've reviewed the different organ systems that are involved in developing our cells. So we've reviewed what starts in their fetus when we first start being made and what organ systems are big in adults. So basically, the stem cell theory is one that based, um, figured out that all these blood cells came from one stem cell, which is crazy when you think about it, that one stem cell can make our entire blood cell system. And so the way that they discovered that is through experiments in which they took mice, irradiated the mice, essentially wiped out their bone marrows, put them into a state of aplasia where they had no cells. They wiped out the cells out of the mice as bone marrow, and then they injected them with new marrow cells. And they watched, and they figured out that these mice's new, brand new marrow cells were able to start differentiating and forming younger like cells, like colony forming unit cells, what we call CFU, which are very young, young, young cells. So it matured from a stem cell to these colony forming unit cells. Those colony unit forming cells started maturing to other cells to finally giving way to a complete blood cell system again. So that's how they determined that everything can come from one stem cell, is that by giving them these stem cells, they were able to form all their cells again. And so we have learned cell, stem cells are self-renewal, and they can produce an entire blood cell system. So these are the three functions of stem cells that they learned from that stem cell theory. Stem cells are capable of self-renewal. They give rise to differentiated progeny which just means that they can give rise to different cell lines. They can make erythrocytes. They can make platelets. They can make different white blood cells. They can give rise to different types. And third, like we saw in the mice, they were able to reconstitute a hematopoietic system of an irradiated host. So if you were to wipe that host clean and put new marrow cells in there, new stem cells in there, they could reconstitute that whole blood cell development system. So you have to remember stem cells are capable of those three items. That's so essential. All right, so when we discuss hematopoiesis charts and things like that, you will hear reference to both stem cells and progenitor cells. 
they are different. Sometimes people get confused and think they're the same thing and they're not. But we know that a stem cell is at the start of it all, gives rise to everything. A progenitor cell is a little bit more mature and more specific to a target line. So it's not at the very beginning of the whole system like a stem cell is. It's a little bit down further and more already dedicated to cell lines. So the first bullet says, like stem cells, progenitor cells have a capacity to differentiate into a specific type of cell, but in contrast to stem cells, they are already far more specific than stem cells. They are pushed to differentiate into the target line or target cell. So again, when I get to the chart here, I'm gonna show you what I mean. But overall, there is thought to be two ultimate types of progenitor, that original stem cell, which we can call non-committed or undifferentiated, meaning it can become anything it wants. It's at the top of the chart. It hasn't decided. It can really become anything. It's non-committed to a line. A progenitor cell is called multipotential and committed, meaning it's kind of already started a target line that it's going to get to and become. It's going to become a red cell. It's going to become a neutrophil. That's a progenitor cell. But overall, these cells work together to help give us all the mature blood cells. So this is a chart that was in your book. I hope it's still in your book. If it's not, it was in the old edition of the textbook. But it's a simplified version of the hematopoiesis chart. And when you look at the top here, you'll see a pluripotential stem cell. And it's sitting up at that top all by itself. And you'll notice it will give rise to every single cell item underneath it. That's where everything comes from a stem cell. So that pluripotential stem cell will divide itself into either the myeloid stem cell or the lymphoid stem cell. And then from there, it continues to divide and go. And so when you get to the very bottom of the chart, you're going to see your mature cells. So on the very left bottom of the chart are your red cells. So that's how it took to develop a red cell. Next to that are platelets. And then we have neutrophils, monocytes, all the white cells are next in the next six lines. So you can truly see how amazing it is one stem equals everything at the bottom. Now, let me define where the progenitor cells would be. So we got the stem cells at the top. The progenitor cells are going to be all these CFU, the CFU gem, the CFU meg, the CFU eo, all of those things in the middle here kind of in the before the beginning, but they're not all the way at the beginning, you can see they're already dedicated to certain cell lines. Those are progenitor cells. All right, so basically, when we go to learning identification of cells, looking at cells in the microscope, you cannot see all the CFUs. You cannot see the stem cell in a microscope. None of that is visible to our naked eye. Um, we actually use surface markers on the surface of them to figure out if they're there. So we use an analyzer to look for surface markers. Um, so anything that's CFU or above to the stem cell, we're not going to be able to see under a microscope. That's just, it's not possible. Even if you had a bone marrow sample, you can't. So we would use the surface markers and other things to help us identify. But everything below the CFU, we can identify under a microscope, and you will learn all these cell lines as we get into them. All right, so there is some of what the initials mean. I do ask that you know these initials and what lines that they're referring to. So if you had gone on this chart, you'll notice that all these initials might be confusing. They do indicate what cell lines they are targeting. So CFU gem, G for the granulocytes, E for erythrocyte, M for megakaryocytes, M for monocyte. Those are the cell lines that CFU gem is kind of dedicating itself to. And you can see the arrows pointing to each of those lines. CFU E is just referring to the erythrocyte line alone. And if you go back to the chart, you'll notice CFU E is only in the erythrocyte line chart. So please get to know what each one of these CFUs target for cell lines. So that if I were to ask you in a test, Oh, oh, CFUGM targets what? You'll notice the granulocyte and monocyte. All right, so as cells mature through that whole hematopoiesis process, things happen to the cells as they mature, and I do need you to know these. So as cells mature, they're actually going to get smaller. They're kind of opposite of people. They start big, and then they go down in size. Um, so they're going to decrease in cell size. You're going to also see a decrease in the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. What that means is 
when cells are really immature, they have a very large nucleus. It takes up most of the room of the cell. As the cells mature, that nucleus drops in size, so you'll have a lot more cytoplasm available. You'll also lose nucleoli. Again, nucleoli are only found in really young, immature cells. So they will start with nucleoli, and then as the cells mature, they'll lose that nucleoli. So you shouldn't see nucleoli in your mature cells. Again, your size of your nucleus decreases. The chromatin inside that nucleus will condense, should become darker. Um, sometimes the nucleus will change shape. Sometimes you'll lose the nucleus completely. Red cells start with the nucleus, and a mature red cell has no nucleus. So sometimes you just completely lose the nucleus. You'll have a decrease in basophilia coloring. So again, it will start with being really dark blue because of all the protein synthesis happening. And again, of a mature cell, it is not dark blue at all. It's a different, it's a lighter shade than that. And then sometimes you get granules showing up as the cells are maturing. So all of those are things that are happening to the cells as they're getting more mature. So when you look at this picture, and I ask you which one is mature and which one's young, I'm hoping that you can see that the one on the left, specifically the big one, let's say with the three nucleoli in it, that's an immature cell. That's a really young cell. It's a very large cell compared to the other things in the picture. You can see the nucleus is quite large. It's basophilic. It's dark blue in color. It's got three nucleoli. When you go to the cell on the right picture, that's a mature cell. It's got a lighter color cytoplasm. In fact, it's kind of pink. The nucleus changed shape, and it's a condensed chromatin. It's very dark chromatin inside that nucleus. So that would be kind of an example of all the changes that can take place in a cell as it goes through it. All right. So with that being said, how do the cells get from the stem cell down to the mature cell. They need help. They can't do it all on their own. So we have what we call cytokines, which are basically hematopoietic growth factors. They're going to help these cells grow. They're going to help these cells keep going and maturing. So we absolutely need cytokines present to get to the bottom, to get to the mature cell. So there is a group of cytokines. All those are listed down at the bottom that are cytokines. We have interleukins, lymphokines, monokines, chemokines, colony stimulating factors, all of these are growth factors. So that's what you need to remember a cytokine is. It's just a growth factor. It helps those cells mature, differentiate, get to what they need to get to. So I'm not going to make you remember all the purpose of every cytokine I listed here. There's going to be a few that we go over. Just know that most cytokines are going to have a positive influence. They want to help those cells mature. There are a few cytokines that will do the opposite. When you think of like tumor cells, things like that forming, they might involve a cytokine that was a negative influence. But overall, the bottom bullet is what I want you to remember off this slide. Precursor cells require growth factors on a continual basis, which helps prevent the cell from dying by inhibiting apoptosis. So if you have these cytokines and they're helping grow, everything's good. The minute that you do not have a growth factor, that, side, that cell will program itself to die off. It's like cell suicide. So apoptosis is programmed cell death. So if there is no growth factor to help it keep going, it's going to die. It's going to kill itself off. So that's what would happen. All right, so just some notes on a couple of these cytokines. We have colony stimulating factors. These are really um, targeting the granulocytes and monocyte lines. There's a bunch here listed. Um, I'm not going to get into this slide. You can ignore this slide if you will, but they have a bunch listed just to help give you an idea of what they do. But again, it's more informational on this slide. Interleukins, well, the word leuk means white blood cells. They do a lot with different white blood cells. Again, this is informational. I'm not going to test you on this. But when you look at the actual overall diagram, this is the more thorough hematopoiesis chart. The other one I showed you earlier was more simplistic. Now you're going to see all these little things in between each stage of cells. Those are all the growth factors necessary to keep that cell line moving along. So it's a lot more complex now when you look at it this way. So interesting. 
All right, one growth factor here. I do want you to know. I want you to know the slide. We are going to mention this growth factor again in a chapter coming up. I think next week, we'll do that chapter next week, actually. We'll mention this again, but I still want you to know about erythropoiesis, so basically red cell development. Um, so erythropoiesis is this cell line all the way on the left of the chart. It's what makes our red blood cells, our erythrocytes, at the end of it. So when you go down to this last main bullet point, it talks about how it requires erythropoietin. That is the growth factor you need to have in order to make red cells, is erythropoietin. It is a hormone that is made by your kidneys. And so that hormone will go to the bone marrow and act on the red cell line to make sure that it gets to the red cell that it needs to make. So when you go back over here, you're going to see EPO down toward the bottom as it keeps going and maturing to get to there. It shows EPO for erythropoietin necessary. So do remember erythropoietin for developing red cells. And again, next week we'll mention it again. So we'll have a slide on erythropoietin next week as well. All right, leukopoiesis is just the development of your white cells. We actually always divide this into two categories. We have myelopoiesis and lymphopoiesis. So the myelopoiesis is going oh, to consist of the neutrophils, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So those four white blood cells are going to be under the myeloid stem cell side. If I go back, you'll see at the top here that pluripotential stem cell made itself into either a myeloid stem or lymphoid. Under the myeloid are going to be your neutrophils, your eosinophil and your basophils for white cells. Under the lymphoid, it's only lymphocytes. That's all that's under that lymphoid stem cell side. So it's called a lymphoid, and they make lymphocytes. So it makes it a little bit easier then to separate which side they're happening on. And then again, megakaryopoiesis will actually create platelets. I know the word platelet doesn't really go with megakaryopoiesis, but that's where you make platelets. There is also a growth factor here called TPO, thrombopoietin. Uh, we'll see this in the platelet chapter again when we learn it down the road. But TPO, thrombopoietin, that is a hormone absolutely necessary to make platelets. And the liver actually will make thrombopoietin and release it to the bone marrow. All right, so that was our hematopoietic theory PowerPoint. I feel like there's a lot more to know there because none of that was as much review as the other one. So that's probably the big PowerPoint for this week. And now there's just one last PowerPoint to look at. And this is just going along with the lab side of what you're going to do on campus. So examination of peripheral blood smear. I believe this is now chapter 16 in your new book. It used to be chapter 15. Now it's chapter 16. All right. So basically in lab, hopefully you already know this because I'm hoping you guys took phlebotomy at some point, you are always collecting an EDTA lavender top tube for hematology. That is our tube that we always need in hematology. So it should be a lavender top EDTA tube. Now, with that being said, there are some people's blood that reacts funky with that EDTA anticoagulant and will form what we call platelet satellitosis, which I have underlined. I underlined it for a reason. I need you to know it. So when you go to make a blood smear, you look at it under the microscope, you're going to notice that the platelets are circling around the white blood cells, which is what we call satelliting, kind of like a satellite cir circles around the earth. We'll have platelets circling around the blood cells. And so when that happens, the analyzer can't count those platelets individually. They think it's all one big cell together. And so it will report a falsely low platelet count. That's not an accurate platelet count because it didn't count all of those platelets separately. So we have to correct that. Any time that you see that in a blood smear where these platelets are circling around the neutrophils, you need to correct it. So what we do is this is the one time that we can draw a sodium citrate light blue top tube instead. And then you run that light blue top through the analyzer for the platelet count and the white count. And when you get your results, you multiply the new result by 1.1, because there's a dilution factor difference. 
and that's your new accurate platelet count for the doctor. So I do need you to know that it's bold for reason. I just keep this in mind. All right, ideally, whenever we're making blood smears, we're making them within two to three hours of collection of that lavender top. Um, you could also make smears, of course, directly from capillary punctures, but beware, there could be platelet clumping occur as the blood's trying to clot on those capillaries, so try to make it quickly. All right, so there's different techniques, and this is what you're going to practice in lab. Some of you are going to be great at this. Um, some of you probably have already done this, maybe in a phlebotomy class or something, but some of you are going to be great, some of you are going to suck. I mean, it's just the way it is. Me, personally, I sucked. I was not that great at making slides. It took me a long time to kind of get the hang of it, and now, like, if I get out of practice, I'm like, oh, God, i got to get this back again. And it'll take me a minute. And some people just, they're great. They're amazing. Like, they can do this all the time. So it is just the way it is. I am not going to explain this. I mean, you can read the directions. You can see the picture. This is far more easier to understand when you actually get in the lab and do it yourself. And there's many techniques. This is just one technique that your book presents to you. There's actually a few different ways you can hold your slide and perform the um, smear. No, there's no wrong way as long as you get the right smear. And so when we look for a good smear, here's what we need to see. We want to ideally see the smear be two-thirds the length of the slide. There should be a nice feather edge rounded. So that means toward the end of that smear, there should be a nice rounded feather edge because when we are looking at cells, we are actually looking down closer toward that feathered edge than we are in the thick part. The thick part is like too clumped. You can't see anything. So we actually really need that feathered edge area to be beautiful because that's kind of where we're at when we look at things. There should be no holes, no streaks, no irregularities in the smear. So that is all good signs of a smear. These are all crappy smears. Um, you can see the jagged edges of the feather edge here on letter A. B, they were picking up their slide as they were making it because you can see where they started, stopped, started, stopped. Letter C and D are just kind of more too short, not enough feathered edge there. Um, e, too narrow. You get the idea. It's amazing how many different ways these slides can come out looking. So that's kind of what a good feather um, slide looks like and what a poor one looks like. All right, once you get an acceptable blood smear, you're going to let it thoroughly dry, and then we're going to stain it. And we typically use the right or right games of stain in the lab. And so there's different kits. Um, so your instructor will tell you how to use your right stain, how long to dip it, or, you know, whatever it might be for that kit. But essentially what is happening is there's going to be a fixative in that right stain that is basically a methanol. And the methanol will make sure that the cells stay stuck to the slide because we certainly don't want them to wash off the slide. There's nothing to look at. So there will definitely be a methanol component in that right stain. Um, the kit that I always use had it separate, but sometimes it's already combined up in there. So just know there's always a methanol to fix cells. And then there are different methylene blue and eucine dyes. The methylene blue is going to stain more basophilic blue components. Eucine will stain more red components. So that will all work together to help you look at it under the microscope and kind of identify cells. So ideally, when you look at a blood smear after staining it and just look at it with your own naked eye, it should be like a pink color, pink red. When you look at it under the microscope, a well-stained smear should have red cells that appear like salmon pink. White blood cell nuclei should be a dark purple or blue. Cytoplasm and neutrophils should be kind of more lilac-y, pinky colored. Eosinophils should have those bright orange granules. These are signs that you did a good job staining. Everything looks good. There are times that you didn't do a good job staining. There's a poor staining technique. And so here's some of the things that can happen there. Um, these are things you should know. Anytime your red cells look more gray in color, the white cells are way too dark, eosinophil granules are gray, your stain was much too alkaline. It wasn't a good pH balance. It was too alkaline. Or you didn't rinse it well enough, so the stain hung on to the slide way too long. Or you did prolonged staining, that kind of thing. Or you can have the opposite, where your cells are way too pale or red, and your white cells are barely visible. You can't even see them. Then the stain might be too acidic, or you understained or over rinse, put too much rinsing on. So just kind of be aware of those problems and the causes that might happen with why they're poorly stained. Okay, so when you go to look at the smear under the microscope, and you guys I'm sure have either done this 
before you will be. Um, anytime that you are looking at something that is stained, you should always have your condenser full up. So I find that is a big, that's a common problem that I see with students. They'll be like, oh, I can't really see this. And they don't think about the condenser. People don't really look at their condenser. Make sure your condenser is always up. So that will make it so much easier because the condenser is what helps direct the light and everything. So it'll help make it easier to see. You'll start on 10x, the lower objective, and just kind of overall look at your slide quality. You can kind of scan for large abnormal cells, that kind of thing. You can go to 40x. Um, 40x is where we would do a white cell estimate. We are going to get into that at some point where you will perform that. So you would do the white cell estimate on the 40x. And then finally, you're going to get to the 100x, which is the oil objective. Please be sure there's oil down. And that is where you're going to do everything else. That's where you're going to count your cells, evaluate the way they look, do a platelet estimate, all that kind of stuff. Again, you should be down toward the feathered edge. You'll know you're in a good spot when you can see the red cells individually. They're not clumped all together. You can see everything individually. They're just close to each other, but they're not like clumpy looking, but you can see everything and nothing looks squished. That's a good area of the slide to be on. So for example, here, the upper left is a great area to be in. I can see pretty much all those cells individually. They all look really nice. When you go to the very bottom, you can tell that's clumped, that's too thick. I can't see the majority of those cells individually to know if there's something in them, what's going on with them. That's too clumpy. And then if you go to the top right, do you notice how much more distorted looking these cells are? They actually have none of that white central pallor area. They're thin, uh, they're very distorted looking. That means that we're way too thin. You're almost at the very end of the smear. So this isn't a good area either over here. So ideally, it should look like the top left area. And then to perform a platelet estimate, I do ask that you remember how to do this right now going forward. Again, you're going to perform this on the 100x oil objective. You are going to count the number of platelets in 10 fields, average that number, and multiply it by 20,000. And that's your platelet estimate. It's not too bad. The reference range for a normal platelet count is 150 to 450. So I would ask starting now that you keep this all in mind. Okay, so that is it for our very first lecture. Um, thank you for hanging in there. And that should be it overall, I think. If you guys need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am in a different time zone currently. I'm in, not, not in Central Time, you're in Central Time. I'm in Arizona time. Arizona doesn't have a um, daylight savings thing. So right now, Arizona's in Pacific time. Um, so we are two hours apart. So I am two hours earlier than you guys. So just always keep that in mind just in case you want to set up a meeting time with me, if you want to, you know, whatever it might be that you need to know about. Uh, but yes, please always feel free to set up meetings if you want to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. We can do so through WebEx, through a phone call. Otherwise, always email. I try my best to answer everything as quickly as I pretty much can. So I'm a pretty open book. So I hope you guys feel free to contact. Otherwise, your lab instructors are on campus are phenomenal. So, you know, work with them. They've been around for ages as well. So I hope you guys have a fabulous week and we will talk again soon. Thank you.